Good evening and welcome to tonight's Cafe Politique. My name is Andrea Rounce and I'm the Academic Director for the Manitoba Institute for Policy Research, which is the organization that's sponsoring tonight's event. And to find out a little bit more about what the Institute does, there's some information on your seat. Um, we can give you some background and there are several of us floating around from the Institute as well that are happy to talk about what it does and what kinds of things it will be doing in the future. So tonight we're here to discuss the campaign that led up to yesterday's Winnipeg municipal election. Winnipeggers voted for their municipal representatives yesterday, resulting in Brian Bowman being elected the mayor of Winnipeg, as well as some turnover in council and uh, in many of the school districts. Tonight we ask about the high, high and the low points of the 2014 municipal election campaign. So for example, we'll be asking questions like, which interest group was the big winner last night? What did we learn from this process? And what did the results mean for the future of Winnipeg? These are some of the questions that our panel will address, um, but only the very beginning. So our moderator tonight is Curtis Brown, uh, Vice President of Probe Research. His detailed biography, as well as those for the rest of the panelists, is found um, on your seats as well. Following tonight's events, one of the things that I'd like to ask you to do is to fill out the evaluation forms that you'll also see on your, on your uh, seats. This is one of the ways that we find out from you what kinds of events you might like to see in the future, what kinds of uh, issues you might like to discuss in a, a forum like this, and we find them very helpful. So thank you in advance for doing that. I'm now going to pass the mic over to Curtis to start us off this evening. Thank great, you. great. Well, thank you very much, uh, Andrea, for the, uh, the introduction, and thank you very much for uh, coming out this evening to uh, take part in, uh, to, to come and take part in this Cafe Politique. Uh, it's really, uh, uh, you know, uh, certainly what we saw yesterday, I think, was a really, uh, you know, really fascinating election and a, uh, and a result that perhaps that we didn't uh, necessarily expect. Uh, but there's certainly lots to talk about, and so we'll, uh, we'll get right into it uh, with the panel. I guess uh, I guess the first thing I, uh, I I would like to put out there, the first thing I would like to ask um, our panelists is, um, you know, what would you say would be the uh, the key or sort of you know if you had to sort of summarize it in about sixty seconds or something like that? Oh, no, uh, that's the I we're gonna hold off that question for a second. What would you say just sort of in sixty seconds or less? What would you say would be sort of you know the key takeaway, the key lesson learned, uh, that sort of thing that uh, that you know you take you are taking away personally from uh, from this uh, campaign? Uh, Royce, let's uh, start with you. It, uh, there was actually a lot of things uh, that political scientists are interested in uh, that manifested themselves in this in this race. Uh, I wrote down a few things. So the first one is that Curtis said this last night, and I had a moment. I said, oh, I wish I had said that. Campaigns matter. This campaign demonstrates that campaigns actually do matter to the outcomes of elections. A lot of people for a long time argued that they don't. This campaign demonstrates pretty definitively that they do. It, uh, the, the campaign says a lot about how uh, uh, candidates actually present themselves to voters as well. Uh, I think Gord Steves is the most interesting case study of this. And the third thing, and the most, the most interesting thing, I think, uh, is the effects of polls uh, uh, in, uh, in election campaigns. My colleague from U of M Political Science, Andrea Rounds, studies polls. All of a sudden, I want to start studying them more because I can see how they actually have an effect on election campaigns. Look at Brian Bowman. When he was polling behind Judy Walsh, Lisa Lease, and, uh, and uh, uh, Cord Steves, people weren't really paying attention to him. As soon as he was ahead, a poll showed that he was ahead of Cord Steves. There was very clearly uh, what we call a bandwagon effect. People were going to him and said to Steves, we saw a complete collapse of Steves' support, a, 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 a shattering collapse of his support as people jumped on the bandwagon, uh, uh, the Bowman campaign. So the, this, this question of polls, I think, is the most interesting thing. And I think it raises the issue of a, of a blackout period, a polling blackout period, that I would kind of like to see a, a, a debate about in the city. I think the, the last poll came out two days before the actual election. So I think that was longer than a minute. As a, uh, as a pollster, that's not music to my ears. <laughs> uh, more polls, I mean more polls. Um, Gino, uh, Gino DeSacia, what would you say would be the biggest uh, the sort of key lesson learned for you or the key thing that you'll take away from, uh, from this campaign? I'll uh, paint two pictures. The first is, I think, perseverance. And I think what we saw in the Bowman uh, camp is that they just didn't give up and certainly buoyed by that last uh, poll. But they really dug deep, and I thought it was like, an interesting, honest campaign. And on the flip side, I thought that Judy's camp sort of took their foot off the gas. They took it too easy. They just didn't quite, 
you know, really push hard at the end to really galvanize some of those key issues that they wanted to connect people with. It was just too much of a front runner campaign that was too simple. She didn't really push it and felt that she could survive on the momentum that she had uh, gained in the early stages of that campaign. I don't think anybody could have predicted last night's uh, swing, but something certainly happened. And you know, part of it is just, I think, the hard work by the Bowman camp to really just keep hammering away at that message that they were presenting something new, something innovative, and they were going to change the way we looked at City Hall. And for some reason, Judy's camp couldn't resonate with enough voters to really say that they had confidence in her ability to take on uh, that uh, role of mayor. Mary, I guess Welsh, what would, uh, what would you say is the uh, key takeaway for you from this uh, campaign that you've been busy covering you know, night and day for the last few yeah. months? Um, two things, I think, since everybody else got two things. Two things. Um, one is that, just for a sec, campaigns matter. And I am, I've covered probably two dozen elections, I think, and I'm still, it is still so much fun to have a night where everybody's shocked and where all the reporters stand there and they're swearing at each other and yelling at each other and oh my god did you ever all the all plans are out the all the pre-made stuff you've written is sort of out the window that is really fun and it's really it's wonderful that politics still has as manufactured as it all is still has the power to really surprise so that's uh, one thing the second thing that i think stayed with me in this election is that for all of our kvetching that there's not enough policy and every, all the policies, you know, you know, isn't costed properly and isn't is sort of, you know, it's a bit light and it's a bit formulaic. We actually did talk about issues. We talked about indigenous issues in the for the first time in any campaign I've ever covered in Manitoba. We really talked about it um, throughout the campaign, not just for two weeks, throughout the whole campaign, um, and and we talked about poverty for the first time actually. We talked about BRT. There were really clear options on BRT or, or LRT um, or, or no RT um, that were there for people and everybody talked about it. And I think that was kind of refreshing. So I actually think we did talk about issues um, to some degree in this campaign. Those are my two. No, that's uh, that's great. I think that's a really good, I think that's a really good point. I mean, I think that there was certainly a lot of um, you're right, a lot of emphasis on, on issues. I, I guess the issue, or I guess the question kind of comes in is about, uh, you know, whether whether the policy proposals, those really clear policy proposals, were actually realistic, or whether, you know, they were costed enough, and I think that was a really, uh, a really interesting debate and discussion to, uh, to you know, to sort of see it, see that unfold. Um, what do you think, is, uh, sort of thoughts on, thoughts on that, do you know, want to say something? Uh, no, just, I, I think, you know, Part of uh, what's going to happen now with the Bowman camp, I mean, they did really set the bar very high in terms of a lot of things that they'd like to do in terms of, you know, pushing the BRT plan forward, which certainly I like to hear. But now it's going to be whether or not they can actually get that work done. And I think that's how his first term is going to be judged. He really pushed forward with a lot of great bold ideas. Some of them I'm not sure he's going to be able to deliver on, but hey, you know what? People liked what they heard and, and they voted for him. And if they don't like it in the next election, they can uh, change that vote. That actually leads in pretty well to uh, something about Bowman raising the bar too high. Um, the, the question is, does, is someone trying to win an election, have a one-off victory, or are they trying to build a political career? Uh, one of the problems with raising the bar too high, and not just in terms of policy, also in terms of, 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 of rhetoric, the idea of transformational change in leadership and the most transparent city hall ever, is that uh, inevitably voters, when you go up for a re-election, they judge you by the standards that you created for yourself in the last election, and uh, I agree, he has uh, raised the bar pretty much into the stratosphere, maybe more than any candidate in an election I've ever seen. And when you when you say things, <clears throat> you're going to run the cleanest uh, uh, campaign. You're going to run the clean. It's going to be a, a new politics. We're going to get rid of the old politics. Something is going to happen in City Hall that is kind of reminiscent of old politics. There's going to be something, and people are going to. Uh, 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 respond to uh, like kind of throwing their hands in the air and saying, "Oh, it's politics as usual." Promises during the election campaign, and then uh, uh, immediately breaks the promises afterwards. So I think he's going to be facing some challenges in that respect as a result of, of raising the bar too high. I, I think too one thing that's really interesting. I think about the Bowling campaign 
is that it was really framed, they, they did a very good job of framing themselves as, as you know, they, they used a lot of terms like, you know, this is new generation leadership and we're running a positive campaign, no more old school, you know, no more old school politics. But really kind of once you kind of got behind the big smile and the buzzwords and the, you know, the nice sounding things, it actually was a fairly, I thought, a fairly cynical campaign. We talked more about partisanship and people's partisan preferences than anyone else, I think any other candidate. And I think there was definitely, I mean, even though, you know, on the surface it was very kind of nice and, and everything, I think beneath that there was a, you know, some real wedges being driven. And, I mean, Mary Hayes, I don't know if you want to weigh in on that, but, uh, I mean, that's just kind of the impression that uh, that, that I kind of got from, uh, from, you know, the way that that campaign was uh, crafted. Yeah, I think on, uh, certainly on Twitter, there was a lot of uh, derision um, pointed at the, the volunteer positivity pledge or whatever it was called, which turned out to be fairly silly. Um, and yeah, it was, I mean, yeah, I think it, he was often the most aggressive, even more so than Gord Steves, I think, often in, in forums. And it is kind of couched in this sort of gentlemanly, fairly slick kind of demeanor that he has. Um, but he also stayed consistently on message. It was, you know, duties too old. And he would never quite say it that way, but that was essentially the undercurrent, I think. Um, I, in fact, I was asking him about that once, and yeah, he was like, you know, you're treading a fine line. He's like, no, I'm not. I'm clearly on one side of the line. I'm, you know, I'm not saying she's old. I'm saying that she's, you know, has, yeah, she has too much experience. And I, you know, I don't, I don't think that quite works. So yeah, yeah. So yes, I, I agree. It was, it was an aggressive campaign, and it worked. Yeah, clearly, clearly, it worked very well, and. Uh, and I mean, it wasn't, you know, it's sort of interesting as I don't think he was necessarily called on it or people, uh, you know, the, the duty watch campaign, I don't think really did it, you know, a job, you know, sort of a job of, you know, really taking the fight to him in that respect, basically until it was too late. Um, let's, uh, just another, I guess another question uh, we, can, uh, we can jump to here. What was the biggest blunder in this campaign? If you had to look at all of the things that candidates uh, said or did, what was the what was the biggest error that uh, that, that uh, you'd say was there? Gino, I'll, uh, I'll start with you this time. What would, uh, what would you say? Was? Well, there's a couple of obvious ones, but I won't touch them. But uh, I still think in the last couple of weeks something happened in, in Judy's camp that they sort of just couldn't they couldn't take it to home drive there. They just couldn't finish the job again, and it just it just disintegrated it seems like in the last two weeks and I don't know if it's necessarily related to that poll I think the writing was on the wall the momentum had dropped and I just think somehow they didn't have a closing act they just couldn't finish the election on a strong note on a positive to build on the momentum of, of being up in the polls earlier on and something the bottom just dropped out and I, I just shake my head and try to wonder what the heck happened like how do you just drop out of the sky so late in the game um, maybe I'll maybe I'll go for the obvious ones. Um, I think there were basically a whole schlack of campaigns that were in them in and of themselves blunders. Paul Havoc Speck ran no campaign essentially, um, especially in the last two weeks. She, I mean, for a sitting councillor to win fewer votes than David Sanders is shocking, frankly. Um, Court Steves clearly that entire campaign he and he kept doubling down on this on this strategy that just wasn't working and. And that also made him out to be not himself, cynical and and not authentic, really. And he was constantly saying, "Yeah, this is what I really believe," and that's not any kind of a way to run a campaign. Um, yeah, so I think we had at least two campaigns that were, in and of themselves, fairly ridiculous. It, it was it was interesting. I thought seeing uh, you know, and Gord Steve's kind of you know the the, the the message and then sort of the way that he kind of ended up being. Sort of caricature a little bit, you know, in terms of you know, sort of the, you know, hardcore right wing candidate, and then in the debates where he's sort of coming across as you know, the sort of charming guy. That, he's uh, great in debates. Yeah, he won every single yeah, debate he was at, he was, hands down. He he's terrific. Yeah, yeah. Royce, Royce, what would you say was the biggest wonder? Uh, I'm not sure. It's probably the the Steves, probably for the last two thirds of the campaign, the overall uh, strategy employed by Steves. Um, to, to build on your point uh, just now, the great political scientist Richard Fenno uh, wrote once that uh, if you're running for public office, you have to find things, themes and policies that, that the voters like, but you also have to find things that work for you as a candidate uh, and that, that you know, you're going to be able to work with. And if you can't do that, then the problem is you, 
just doesn't work. You, you may appear insincere, uh, disingenuous, it just comes unstuck. And I think that Steve's is a, a really good example of where we've actually seen that. If you know anything about Gord Steve's as a counselor, you know he was a moderate, he was a compromiser, negotiator, well known for bringing people together. Uh, and he's, as we saw in the debates, he's enormously personable, uh, but he ran like he was uh, Vic Taves in this election campaign. He thought that Winnipeg was Steinbeck. Uh, and so there was that, I mean, I understand why he did that. That'll probably come up at some point in this debate. He was uh, uh, in a field of three well-known candidates on the right side of the spectrum. He thought this was the way to get around it, but you can't just totally reinvent yourself. In election campaign, there was an incoherence, and it came through very clearly, I thought. I also thought the other thing, too, is I mean, there was one point in August where he was basically coming out every other day with uh, policy announcements. And I mean, some of them were things that, yeah, the majority of people probably wouldn't necessarily agree with, or they wouldn't necessarily be, be winning issues. I mean, he really, you know, he, he was against you know, rapid transit, I and mean, that's something actually, I guess, the, you know, our polling shows the public actually is, is actually kind of more in favor of. But, uh, you know, really hard against rapid transit. He's going to freeze taxes. Uh, he's going, and then the photo radar thing, he kept coming back to that. And then it just kind of was like, you know, so he was doing that. And, and we did a poll at the end of August, I remember, that showed that uh, he was up actually just in, in second, just a little bit ahead of both, Brian Bowman. And, uh, and then, I mean, you know, obviously some other, you know, he had some other issues happen in his campaign as well. But then it's just like he didn't have anything else to say. And, and my sense was like that was, you know, right up to Labor Day. He was really actually, I thought actually, you know, having some traction in spite of, you know, some of the challenges that he was having with the, you know, the, wife's, the issue of his wife's Facebook post and everything else. But then it was just like, that's it. There was no more, there was no more message. I don't know if that's my perspective. I don't think his campaign could recover from the, uh, just the issue with his wife and the whole thing. It just, I think it just derailed him. I think it deflated the campaign and I don't think he knew how to react. and. Going back and back on the, the the BRT, it just became such a rhetoric. I'm going to cancel. I mean, with the Sam Cates ran that election uh, a decade ago, where you know his whole thing was babies over buses or whatever. When he had that thing where he was going to cancel the the rapid transit, and ended up costing the city you know a hundred million dollars in, in extra costs from that delay alone. It was, I mean, it was one of the most ridiculous things. But at that time probably the polls would have come out that Winnipegers simply didn't really care about rapid transit. And, and now I think we've turned a bit of a corner and, and I think that there's a bit of momentum behind that. So I think Steve's completely misread that, given he was on council when they approved uh, the transportation plan, the BRT plan, all the amendments, and now all of a sudden he's standing in the field saying this is the most ridiculous thing. Yeah. And I think people just said, no, we're not, we don't believe you. And, and I think it goes to your point that there's just something that he just became unbelievable. We've, uh, we've, we've so we spent the last few minutes beating up on court Steve. Uh, but uh, I, I want to come back to a point that you had uh, that you made earlier, Gino, about you know the blunder I guess for Judy Wasilewski, Judy Wasilewski's campaign being that you know really she couldn't um, uh, you know sort of couldn't close the door at the closing argument. You know I. I use hackney sports analogies all the time, and so I can break out another one today. But, um, you know, it sort of reminded me, I mean, like, you know, the World Series is on right now in baseball, right? And it's sort of like, you know, having a starting pitcher who's really dominant. And, you know, really what our polls were, you know, what polls were showing and sort of what it looked like is that, you know, she was ahead, you know, she, she was ahead and in command and in the lead in the fourth inning, the fifth inning. But it's almost like she stayed in too long. And I mean, you know, in baseball, I mean, someone, the starting pitcher, there was too many pitches. Um, the hitter starts to know what's coming. Uh, they kind of, you know, they're starting to get tired. It's, you know, there isn't really a lot there, and then they kind of get blown up. And I think that's kind of, you know, that's in my perspective, sort of in terms of what happened is that, you know, all of a sudden late in the game, where they really kind of, you know, she didn't have her best stuff anymore, and just, you know, got lit up by Brian Bowman basically, and, and that ended up swinging the, swinging the results. So again, forgive that, forgive that hacking analogy, but I guess I just, the question I have is, what could she have done to, to get to the finish line? I, I don't think she could have done anything. The, uh, the, the problem is for the entire campaign, she ran an excellent uh, textbook frontrunners campaign. She was committed to it. Uh, and I can imagine that in her war room, there were debates between people who said, we need to do something, we need to strike out, uh, we need to change strategy. And people saying, no, stick with the frontrunner strategy. We're out in front, it's, it's gonna pay off. But it just didn't end up happening. I think one place where I do agree with Gino is that for, for uh, uh, Judy herself, 
she really kind of seemed to lose discipline at the end of the campaign. She was super disciplined for the entire campaign. That's what a front runner strategy is all about. But this whole thing where she's kind of talking to Bowman about uh, severance, the, the off, the uh, conversation she didn't know was being recorded, that totally undisciplined, totally surprising and out of character for a, a candidate that has really been disciplined for the entire campaign. Um, I think uh, in order to, I guess, hit a home run, to keep with the analogy, this is the only time I'll ever hear me talk about sports, you have to know that you're supposed to do that and you have to do that. And I don't think Judy's campaign had any idea how, in what kind of trouble, what kind of trouble they were in. Um, and that was pretty clear last night at her headquarters talking to some of the senior strategists. They woke up thinking they were going to win and the polls closed at 8. They thought they got their marks, they were good. It was, they had it pretty much in the bag. Um, and so to, to develop your closing week strategy, you have to know you need one. And I don't think they, I don't think they knew they needed one. They thought they could just grind it out. Pretty much, out. yeah. And that you and I argued about this last night that the NDP machine would work, and it's clear, it's clear the Labour Council machine didn't work, and it's clear the NDP machine didn't work in a lot of places in the city. Right. I mean, I think there was, you know, earlier on, even I think before Judy declared, I think there was some rumblings about who was going to run uh, in terms of the left. Uh, the left kind of leading candidates. So I think there was a little uncertainty from the get-go. Uh, not that Judy didn't deserve to run, and, and she ran a, a pretty okay campaign, I guess, for the most part. Take out the last few weeks, maybe she didn't have her foot on the gas, but, you know, I don't know. I mean, I think maybe the campaign was just sputtering about, and sure, the polls were coming out, and that buoyed their uh, confidence, and it buoyed them knocking on the doors, but I think what they didn't realize is that they had to do more. Yeah. That Bowman's team and others were working really hard, and, and same with uh, Ulet. He was out there working. He was like pushing ideas and really uh, getting some face time. And she, I think, you know, for good or bad, maybe was just in the back room a bit too much. You know, take it easy, don't say too much. Front runner, don't rock the boat. But I think she needed to rock the boat because it was a campaign where others were rocking the boat, and she felt that she could just drift along. No, that's a, that's a, that's a great point. I think just that you know, that's that's what ended up happening.